Welcome to the lecture, lecture number 10, part 1. We now enter the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John. And I want to remind you what the theme will be for this section. It would be that Matthew and Luke begins with Jesus' birth. Mark begins with his baptism, but the book of John begins with the creation. I want you to know, it begun, and in fact, it begins before creation itself. So I want you to understand the great differences between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew and Luke begin with Jesus' birth. Mark begins with the baptism of Christ, but John begins before the creation. So that sh you should see in this theme the profound differences between the four distinct Gospels. Let me also remind you that we've now entered lecture 10, and in your books, in Dr. Carson's book, you should be at page 225 all the way to page 254, and then in Dr. Benware's book, you should be at pages 122 to 128 in your reading. Right? Make sure you get that done, and remember that you have a test that has to be turned in with that. John. John is a completely distinct gospel, how it's laid out, and I want you to notice and appreciate the highlights of this particular book. As I said, Matthew and Luke begins with Jesus' birth. Mark begins with the baptism or with his baptism, the baptism of Jesus Christ, and John begins before the creation story. That's the distinctiveness of the book of John. Now, John presents the full deity of Jesus of Nazareth from the very first verse of the first chapter and repeats this particular emphasis okay, in, okay, uh, okay, throughout the gospel. I want you to understand the emphasis in the book of John, in the gospel of John, is the deity of Christ from the beginning before creation, before what you and I understand as the concept of time. The synoptic gospels, okay, that would be Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And yes, I, I, I understand how you have it in your Bibles is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But the way we lay it out, it would be Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And I want you to understand, the synoptic gospels themselves, those three, okay, they tend to veil this truth until late in their presentations. Um, it's very, very late, as it, we, if you remember in our last, uh, is, a, and concluding the book of Luke, we see who he is at the very, very end, clearly at the resurrection. Okay? We see that. Okay? And that's in chapter 24 of the book of Luke. What I want you to comprehend is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay, um, really is what a lot of theologians, they call it the messianic secret, the messianic secret. That's how it's called, the Messianic secret in, in the theological world, because it's so veiled in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, chapter 1, verse 1, coming right out of the gate, if you will, the book of John declares, okay, in all of his glory, the deity who, who Jesus Christ is. So immediately we grab, we get the theme of what John's going to be dealing with. Apparently, John develops his gospel in light of the basic affirmations of the synoptic gospels. That is what we believe. He attempts to supplement and interpret the life and the teachings of Jesus in light of the needs of the early church, the first century church. Okay? That's what he's talking about. So John's perspective on how he's writing okay, is in light of that the synoptic gospels have already been written. Okay? He was the last apostolic witness. This is the same John we believe to be the same one. He dies at, at the age of 95. It's, it's incredible. Okay? He's on the island of Patmos, if you remember that. Okay? Um, and so I want you to see this with me. Now, John, this is very crucial for to understand also. The book of John. John seems to structure. Right? His presentation of Jesus the Messiah, and he does so around four major themes or four constructed areas. This is how he does it. When you break it down, I find that if you break each book down, 
you can begin to see how it flows. Rather than what we traditionally do in the pulpit is that we rip out two, three verses out of a uh, section of scripture and we teach on that. And usually we teach it, okay, in, not in the light of its context. And so we got a great story, we got a great teaching, okay, and we got some kind of form of application, but I'm never certain is it in the context of what God actually said and how it was intended to be said. So John seems to structure his presentation of Jesus the Messiah around four major areas. Number one, seven miracles, signs, okay, and their interpretation. Number one, there are seven miracles, seven signs, right, and their interpretation. That's really crucial, you understand that. So there are seven major miracle signs in the book of John, and the interpretation that becomes crucial to understanding the Gospel of John. Number two, okay, 27 interviews or dialogues with individuals. There are 27 major dialogues, 27 major interviews, 27 major conversations that take place in the book of John that become crucial to us understanding the book of John. Number three, there's certain worship and feast days. The worship and feast days become crucial to understanding the book of John. A, the Sabbath. The Sabbath gets dealt with extensively. B, the Passover. The Passover alone gets dealt with in John chapter 5 and John chapter 6. 5 and 6 just deals with this subject matter as a global major theme inside the book of John. Okay? C, the tabernacles. Okay? The tabernacles, the feast of the tabernacles. That entire, that whole section, that would be, that would be John chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 covers that whole section in the book of John. Then D, Hanukkah. Hanukkah gets dealt with also, but it gets dealt with in John chapter 10, okay, verses 22 all the way to verse 39. So we now have, number one, the seven miracles and signs and interpretation. Number two, the 27 major dialogues and or interviews, if you will, that takes place inside the book of John. And number three, there's the worship and feast days. We said the Passover, the pa um, we said the Sabbath, the Passover, we said the tabernacles and, and Hanukkah gets dealt with extensively. Then number four, number four is a little bit, we're going to break number four down a little bit so you have a, a better grasp of it. And that would be the I am statements. I am statements. The I am statements are crucial to the book of John. A, it's related to the, it's related to the, divine, the, to the divine name of Yahweh. Okay? So this is how we get away from having to pronounce it Yahweh, okay, or what we would call Jehovah, all right? And what we have is I am is used. Number one, on the point A, I am he. Jesus declares openly who he is. And this is really crucial because what you often hear about the book of John, at least through the Synoptic Gospels, okay, and, um, and repeat, and you, may, you hear it a lot today, that Jesus never really declared his Messiahship, his deity, who he really was. He just allowed people to speak for himself and so forth and so forth. Well, I mean, I want you to think about that. Is that true? Because if you open your Bibles and look in John, and in John chapter 4, let's just walk through this. In John chapter 4, and look at this at, in the middle of that chapter in verse 26. In verse 25, the Messiah said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. Then what, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And look at verse 26. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am 
E. Now, does that sound like Jesus is veiling himself, hiding, being coy? No. He's very, very clear about that. We also see here in John chapter 8. Look at this in John chapter 8. And look with me down there in verse 24, where he says, but back it up to verse, go to verse 21. John 8, 21. And then he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and, you, and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And he says, and he was saying to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Now look at verse 24. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He continues his dialogue. Jump down to verse 27. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Look at verse 28. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And I do not do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Now, remember who he's talking about. He's talking to the Jews at this point directly. He's very direct, okay? And they understood the terminology of the Son of Man because that was what we find back in the Old Testament. So clearly he was declaring his deity. He is the Messiah. Also, we find in John chapter 13, look at this in verse 13, in chapter 13, and we see this here in uh, verse 19, but break it up to verse 18. John 13, 18, he says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones that I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now look at verse 19. From now on, I am telling you, believe before it comes. He says, he says, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that what? I am he. Right? I am he. Huh? Well, again, he declares openly in chapter 18. Look at this. At the very beginning of that chapter. Remember when he's arrested? Right? Remember he's arrested? Now look at this. <clears throat> and remember we, we looked at that back in, um, in uh, Luke chapter 22. You recall that back in chapter 22, verse 47 to 53? In that whole section of his actual arrest, right? Now, look, this, we get part of this story, get related in the book of John, but from a different perspective. Now, look at what he says here in verse 1. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kindrum, and where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now, Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Verse 3. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and the officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with the lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, and went forth and said to him, Whom do you seek? Look at verse 5. They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. And so verse 6, so then when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They had come into the very divine presence of the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah. Point two on the point A. Before Abraham was I am, he declared. Go back to John chapter 8. At the end of that chapter, huh? you see with me, look what he does at the end of that chapter. Go to verse um, 54. Jesus answered, 
If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it when it, and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out in the temple. So he declares, so where do we get this notion then that he, Jesus, never openly declares who he is? Clearly the scriptures say something to the contrary, and the book of John, the gospel of John, eh, highlights this. This becomes really, in, in my mind, the anchor to the book of John. Although we have great chapters inside the book of John. But this is it. Now, what we need to understand here is that point B is that with predicate nominatives, look at this. Look at what he does. In the book of John, he says, number one, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He says that very clearly in the book of John, chapter 6, verse 35. He says it in verse 41. He says it in verse 48. He says it in verse 51. Number two, I am the light of the world. <laughs> Jesus makes that, that, that statement. I am the light of the world. He says that in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am. I am. And number three, I am the door of the sheepfold. He says that very clearly in John chapter 10, verse 7 and 9. He says, number four, I am the good shepherd. He says that very clearly in John chapter 10, verse 11 and 14. Number five, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He says that in John chapter 11, verse 25. Then he says, number six, I am the way and the truth and the life. And we all know that one. That is John 14, 6. And number seven, he says, I am the true vine. I am. He says that in John chapter 15, verse 1 and 5. So this is the construct. This is the structure of the presentation of, the, of, of Jesus the Messiah and it's built around these four major sections inside the book of John. So now you can see the perspective of this gospel is very, very distinct. You remember that I had told you that Matthew and Luke, okay, begin with the birth of Jesus, whereas Mark begins with his baptism, but John begins before the creation. So we begin to see a completely distinct flavor for the book of John. Now, the differences between John and the other Gospels, I think, need to be highlighted here. Number one, although it is true that John's primary purpose is theological, it is, because that's really where we see a lot of theology of the Christ is unpacked for us here in the book of John. His use of history and geography is extremely accurate and detailed in the book of John. It is absolutely stunning to see the accuracy that he, that he, that he portrays inside of the book of John with regard to geography and history. Um, the exact reason for the discrepancies between the synoptics and John is uncertain. I am not that smart to be able to tell you why that is. We do know that they are. Uh, there are two things let me lay out for you possibly a an early Judean ministry the early cleansing of the temple if you recall that and B the chronology and the date of of the last week of Jesus life um, we see the, the discrepancies inside the synoptic gospels plus including the book of John uh, we're not really given the reason as to why but as much as the perspective the distinct perspectives that we get from the four Gospels. Secondly, it would be helpful to take a moment to discuss the obvious difference, okay, between John and the synoptics, which would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, probably, uh, if you ever got a chance to read uh, Dr. George uh, Eldon Ladd, L-A-D-D -D book, he wrote a book called A Theology of the New Testament, and in it, he talks about the differences, and let me just quote what he says here with regard to that particular subject. 
he says, the fourth gospel is so different from the synoptics that the question must be honestly faced whether it reports accurately the teachings of Jesus or whether Christian faith has so modified the tradition that history is swallowed up in a theological interpretation. Okay. So he addresses that issue. He also says, the solution that lies close to hand, to hand is that the teaching of Jesus are expressed in what's called the Johannian idiom. In other words, Luke had his own style of writing. He had his own vocabulary. So did Mark because he used primarily Peter's. Okay? And, uh, and but remember that Mark was a Gentile, so he used a lot of his Gentile language to really interpret what Peter was saying, and that's what the book of Mark is about. Okay? And then Matthew, we know, had a very distinct Jewish vocabulary. Johannian uh, idiom or vocabulary was quite different because he addressed a Gentile world. Okay? And perhaps we find some of the differences is due to that. Now, if in fact that is correct, um, then the, if this is the correct solution, and if we must conclude that the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, is couched in Johannian and Johannian idiom, this important question follows. To what extent is the theology of the fourth gospel that of John rather than that of Jesus? I, I, I think it's a legitimate question. I think it is a, leg, a, a legitimate question uh, because, see, Language always communicates culture, and I think we forget that. It always does, right? Um, so then the question is, did he get caught up in his own cultural language, which then meant he has his own cultural theology? Okay? And that has been an issue that's been attacked with regard to the book of John. Okay? And you go, wow, we never hear that stuff. We come to church every Sunday and blah, 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 blah. No, but your pastors do, and your pastors have been influenced by it. So to what extent? Well, to what extent has the teaching of Jesus been so assimilated in John's mind that what we have is a Johannian interpretation rather than an accurate representation of Jesus' own teaching? That question is the one that has to be settled and must be wrestled with. And it is. It's, it's wrestled with in Bible schools. It's wrestled with in Bible colleges and in, in colleges and universities and Christian colleges and universities. Um, and seminaries. It's been dealt with. There are numerous books that have been dealing with it. In fact, it's, it's bordered now into the hundreds of books that has dealt with the subject. And yet, I'm always amazed to see how that if you took 100 books, you probably have close to about 50 different interpretations and about another 50 shadings of those original 50 interpretations. So it's that wide and that broad, this issue. But if you would take the time, just set all of that aside and you would just look at how this book flows in light of that Mark, Matthew, and Luke okay, have dealt with all the other issues quite extensively, then I think the question gets settled. Welcome back to Lecture 10. This is going to be part two. Let's continue with part of this discussion with George Ladd. Now, the question becomes, why do we have to deal with this over and over again? Well, I was just having this conversation, and that is with regard to if you were just to take the epistles in Paul. If you dealt with, uh, with Paul and his epistles in Galatians and Colossians, Philippians and Thessal okay? Thessalonians, okay, but particularly Galatians and Colossians, um, uh, you, you, you'll see in Ephesians, you'll see this very clearly in those epistles where he has to deal with heresies. He's dealing with heresies and false teachings and all kinds of theories and stuff that's coming up. Uh, Jude, if you were to take Second Peter and Jude, has to deal with those issues. It, it has to wrestle those issues. The Thessalonian books have to do, wrestle with those issues. We see it clearly in the, in, the, in, the, in the corrective letter of the Corinthians, okay? The first, the first letter of correction for the, of the Corinthians. We see it uh, in Titus. So, this stuff just doesn't go away. The problem is whatever, whatever the pastor in that local church is, when he gets to the book of John, depending on who he's reading, 
who he's heard from, Mm-hmm. The, the, you know, the, the, the saying is that there's nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. It just things get repackaged over and over and over again. And John is one of those books that have been attacked head on. But it's a, it's the same thing over and over again. And you go, well, it's not important for us to understand, to know all that. Yes, it does become important because you're standing in the pulpit or you're listening to somebody who's standing in the pulpit who's been influenced by one of these writers. Somewhere in their studies. Now, Ladd himself, George Ladd, he now quotes a number of other things. You know, and this is what he does. He quotes W.F. Albright, uh, who wrote a book, The Recent Discoveries in Palestine and the Gospel of John. And that's found in the background of the New Testament and, and, and its eschatology, which is a huge volume of book. And it's edited by both W.D. Davies and D. DeBow. And so I want you to know that it's in there. Um, I do remember in seminary having to read that and go through it. Um, but there is, and this issue did come up, at least at the seminary that I was located, it became an issue. And there is, and I was just amazed by that. Now, granted that it's been, you know, what has it been, uh, more than 25 years ago when I was there. But I want you to see this. And this is what Ladd says. He's quoting W.F. Albright. He says, there is no fundamental difference in the teaching between John and the synoptics. The contrast between them lies in the concentration of tradition along certain aspects of Christ's teachings, particularly those which seem to have resembled the teaching of the Essenes most closely. And if you remember in studying studying out uh, the Word of God that we had the zealots, we had the Sadducees, we had the Pharisees, we had the scribes, and there's another group, the Essenes. There was another group in there as well. Okay? There is absolutely nothing to show that any of Jesus' teachings have been distorted or falsified, or that a vital new element has been added to them. That, that, that the needs of the early church influenced the selection of items for inclusion in the gospel, we may readily admit. But there is no reason to suppose that the needs of that church were responsible for any inventions or innovations of theological significance. We just don't have a body of evidence telling us that. It's just, it's not there. It's suppositions, but it's not there. One of the strangest uh, assumptions uh, of, the, of, of uh, critical New Testament scholars and theologians is that the mind of Jesus was so limited that, that any apparent contrast between John and the synoptics must be due to the, difference, the differences between early Christian theolo- the, uh, theolog- um, the, uh, theologians. Every great thinker and personality is going to be interpreted differently by different friends and hearers who will select what seems most congenial or useful out of what they have seen and heard. Again, George Ladd, I think... He's pretty succinct. Uh, he's pretty succinct with the issue. I, I do remember some of we argued a whole semester. Okay. Hmm. I, 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 just, I just remember that. I, I was just amazed. And, and, you know, when you go, well, how can that be, you know? You know, how can we get into an argument, a whole class, a whole semester talking about the Johannian uh, 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 I- idiom, you know, the language how he, that he used, and yet it became a whole semester of arguing back and forth, and then people were in the libraries, they were digging stuff out of the libraries, going back and forth and back and forth, and we just kept getting in deeper and deeper and deeper in the muck and the mire, and, you know, and I, 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 I just don't, don't forget, I just, I don't forget it because there was a young lady in the class, and she said, well, you know, has anybody bothered to read George E. Ladd? You know, and all the heads turned around. Who? <laughs> uh, and, and, and he pretty much summed it up what I've just been talking about. You know, uh, Again, he says this, George E. Ladd says this, point D. The difference between them is not that John is theological and the others are not, but that all the theological, but that all are theological in different ways. I like that. Interpreted history may represent more truly the facts of a situation than a mere chronicle of events. If John is a theological interpretation, it is an interpretation of the events that John is convinced happened in history. 
It is obviously not the intent of the Synoptic Gospels to give a report of the, okay, of the, what was called the Ipsima, okay, the Ipsisma Verba, which is Latin for the exact words, okay. Uh, Jesus nor biography, so it wasn't, that's not the intent of the Synoptic Gospels. And, and uh, yet, that, that is the problem. A lot of people believe it is. And so that's not what the intent is. Eh? It wasn't to report, you know, the exact words that Jesus nor biography of, of the events of his life. Yet, that's how people take the Gospels. There are portraits of Jesus and summaries of his teaching. M Matthew and Luke feel themselves to be, to feel free to rearrange the material in Mark and not to report Jesus teaching with considerable freedom. They didn't do that. If John used more freedom than Matthew and Luke, it is because he wished to give a more profound and ultimately a more real portrait of Jesus. So we, we, get, we get stuck in the Makamaya because we really don't understand the construct, okay, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when we get to John, it's like all bets are off. And yet we seem to forget that they had, they're, they're, they're reporting the events and the life and the teachings of Jesus, okay? okay? And remember who they're reporting to, the four distinct audiences, four distinct locations, for distinct reasons. Yet, they really, they don't contradict each other. It's being reported from a different perspective. So I need you to comprehend that with regard to the book of John as well. So let's talk a little bit about the author himself, John. Uh, the gospel, uh, just like the other gospel, is anonymous, but it hints at John's authorship. We know that. Uh, we know that John was an eyewitness. We know that very because at the end of the book of John, at the very end of the book of John, um, in chapter 19, at the end in verse um, 35, and he who has seen what has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. Okay? So we know that John at least says, I'm an eyewitness and he declares that to be so. And the phrase that he uses, the beloved disciple, that phrase that you find repeated throughout the John, okay? Uh, both uh, Polycrates and Irenaeus identify him in the early church history, in the early church father, as John the Apostle. We know that John, the son of Zebedee, never is mentioned by name. We know that, okay? Um, we know that in the scriptures. Uh, also, in addition to that, in point B, the historical setting is obvious from the gospel itself. Therefore, the issue of authorship is really not a crucial factor in his actual interpretation. We know that to be true. The affirmation of an inspired author is crucial, um, but not the author himself. The authorship in the date of John's gospel does not affect inspiration. Uh, I think we, sometimes we kind of forget about that, but interpretation. Uh, commentators seek a historical setting and occasion that caused the book to be written as the other Gospels were. Should one compare John's dualism to the, number one, to the Jewish two ages or to the Qumran teacher of righteousness or to the Soristerian religion or to the Gnostic thought or to the unique perspective of Jesus? Well, should we? Well, in addition to that, the early church tradition view is that John the Apostle, what the son of Zebedee, is the human eyewitness source here. Uh, this must be clarified because the second century external sources seem to link others in the production of the gospel. Um, we know that that happened. We know that there's controversy about that, but from other sources, not the biblical source, but from other sources. For example, Number one, fellow believers and the Ephesian elders encouraged the aging apostle to write. We know that. They had encouraged him because he was, he's the last of the apostles, the last of the disciples, write this down for the benefit of the church. Okay? We know that Eusebius, the historian, he quotes um, Clement of Alexandria, who's requesting this. Uh, we also know that a fellow apostle, Andrew, according, at least according to the Moratorian fragment, which was written somewhere between 180 AD to 200 AD um, from Rome, uh, 
says that it, it says that, that that could have been him. Now, some modern scholars have assumed another author based on several assumptions about the style and the subject matter of the gospel. Many assume an early second century date. They think it's somewhere on the 115 AD when this is put together. Uh, it was written by John's disciples, uh, is what it was believed, the Johannian circle of influence who remembered his teachings. Um, and we have some pretty heavyweights, uh, scholars and theologians who believe that that's, a, that, that, that's what happened. Uh, for example, J. Weiss B. Lightfoot believes that. Uh, C. H. Dodd, uh, O. Kuhlman, uh, R. A. Culpepper, K. C. Barrett. I mean, these are heavyweights. Um, they, they believe that that's when John was written, somewhere about 115, by some of his disciples. Also uh, written by the elder John, uh, one of a series of early leaders from Asia influenced by John's uh, The Apostle Theology and Terminology, which is derived from some obscure package, uh, uh, passage, some obscure passage that's found in Papias writings, um, which is somewhere between, you know, Papias was around 70 AD to 146 uh, uh, and it was quoted by Eusebius uh, uh, later on, two centuries later, between 280 and 339. Um, so th that's, I'm not going to deny that that stuff is not out there. It is out there. Uh, but I remind you that it's not in here. Okay? It's not in the gospel itself. Right? So with that in mind, and uh, going through what we would call gobbledygook, okay, if you will, let's look at the evidence for John himself as the primary source for the material of the gospel. Now, where will we begin with that? Well, I think we'd have to begin with the internal evidence, right? We've looked at the external possibilities, the external evidence, at least much of the hearsay, and a lot of heavyweight scholars and theologians who believe that that, in fact, may be true. But ultimately, is there any internal evidence within the book itself that would draw us to the author of this book? Well, <clears throat> internal evidence, number one, A. We know that the author knew Jewish teachings and rituals and shared their Old Testament world view. That's really important. Because if you recall, as we move into the first century, <clears throat> and the Gentile and the church is growing by leaps and leaps and leaps and bounds by Gentiles. Gentiles is what's really growing up the church at a, an incredible rate. Okay? Um, yet, whoever this person was had a very distinct and profound understanding okay, of the teachings of Jewish teachings and rituals and share the Old Testament worldview. So we know that. So they often had that, at least in mind. B, the author knew Palestine and Jerusalem before A.D. 70. Okay? That's really important because the description that we get, you remember that in a couple of classes ago I said that John, the, the exactitude, the preciseness of John's geographical and historical data is uncanny. Uncanny. It's just absolutely incredible. So if John's gospel was written, as many scholars say, they, back in 115, think about it, A.D., that would mean that it's 45 years removed from the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. But when you read the Gospel of John, this is someone who has an accurate picture of prior to A.D. 70. So you need to take that under consideration. Also, see the author claims to be an eyewitness. So whoever this John is, he claims to be an eyewitness. Uh, look, if you go to John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says, 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. He says, among us. He's not quoting somebody else. John's gospel is not, it does not approach its writing like Luke did from a bunch of other sources. Where, and he says it openly and distinctly what he's doing. Okay? John does not do that. So he says, among us, and he's testifying, he is an eyewitness. Also, you remember that I read John chapter um, 1935. You remember that? Okay. As well. Well, and it says that he's an eyewitness. Well, look at John chapter 21. At the end of John, John 21, and we see this over there in verse, um, let's see, is it 23? 22, 23, um, no, 23, in verse 23, therefore saying, this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come. What is that to you? Verse 24, this, is, okay, verse 24, this is the disciple who is testifying to these and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Okay? So clearly, if we're looking at the internal evidence that it is John himself who is the author of this. Now, we also know that the author was a member of the apostolic group, okay, for he was familiar, uh, and let me tell you something, we know it had to be, okay? So I think we can debunk a lot of the issues um, as we look at the internal evidence of the book of John as to its own authorship, okay? Well, we know that he had to be a part of the original apostolic group. Why? Because he's familiar with a number of things. Number one, the details, okay, of time and place of the night trials. Remember that? He, John is the one who gives us all the gaudy little details of that. Okay? So he had to have been present and been there. Whoever this author, if, if you just want to leave out here in a bubble over here and just, and just put a question mark and off, just for the moment, okay? If, if that's, you know, that'll just float your boat on that one, okay? Let's just watch this. So, because I'm about to, I, I think I can burst this bubble. Um, so we know that he had to have a lot of detail, number one, of the time and the place of the night trials, because it's explicit in the book of John. Secondly, he had the details of the numbers, Remember when you get to John chapter 2 um, in verse, is it 5? And his mother said to the servants, wherever he says to you, do it. Now there were, now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish customs of the purification, certainly 20 or 30 gallons each. Okay, so we know that he detailed information as to the number of water pots we know that. And the fish. Remember the issue of the fish? You know, it, all the way. In fact, we were there uh, um, just a little while ago back in, in 21. In, the, in John 21, we see this in the story that's unfold. And down here in verse 9, and so when they got up out of the land, and when they got out on the land and they saw a charcoal fire already laid in the fish placed in it, bread, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew in the net and the land full of large fish and 153 of them. Although there were so many, the net was not torn. See that? And so Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question, Lord, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? So whoever this person was, he has all of this detailed information. Okay? He has the information of the detail of persons. Remember, I told you that John is very unique because it has 27 distinct dialogues, interviews with different distinct people, and detail. So he had to have been present. Because we know that in all those dialogues, overwhelming the majority of the time, the disciples were present. One or two of them at least. Okay? Also, he had knowledge of the details of the events and the reaction to all of those events. That's what's, that's what's unique. So, if we're going to argue about the authorship, because that is, that it becomes crucial, because this is where once, if you, could, if you could deny the author, then you can deny the details. And that's where we get into trouble if we're not careful. And yet, the internal evidence shows overwhelmingly 
pop, we can pop that bubble, okay, that in fact it is John. Also, the author seems to be designated as, remember, who, whoever this is, is the same person who is always designated as what? As the beloved disciple, the beloved disciple, the beloved disciple, the beloved disciple. And we see this, just, in a, just to absolutely bore you, go to John chapter 13 and look at this with me. In John 13, down in verse 21, is it? No, 23. And there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's the same guy. Look at verse 25. He says, and leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus then answered. Remember that conversation that we're having? Okay. It's got to be the same person here. We know that in John 19, uh, we see this later on in 19, and we, said, uh, and we see this when he says, in verse 26, and when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, whom he loved, we see that in John, okay? And we see it in verse 27 also, he says, and then he said to the disciples, behold your mother, from that hour the disciple took her into his own household. Well, we know from at least all the historical records, okay, that it was John who took in the mother of Jesus, the apostle, okay? We know that. So we have a lot of corrobor corroborating evidence on that. And then we also know that in John chapter 20, um, we know that it says starting in verse 2, and so she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, we know that it was Peter and John that was there. So we see this evidence over and over again. We see it in verse 8. And so the other disciple who had first come to the tomb also entered, and he saw and he believed whom, the, whom he loved. So we see this over and over again. So the evidence is overwhelming that it must be John. Welcome back, Lecture 10, Part 3, and let's see if we can close this section out talking about the authorship. Once again, the question becomes, why is that so important? Because once you attack the author, then you begin to attack the veracity of the book. And that is the reason why. Which is the reason why for those modern-day preachers who don't believe in the Trinity, okay, John, you will find a lot of times they attack John. John is the book that they attack many, many times. We left off talking about how he was John, the beloved, uh, the beloved disciple. The uh, no, point number F is that the author seems to be a member of the inner circle along with Peter. This comes up over and over again. We saw in John 13, 24, that he is a member of the inner circle. We see it in John chapter 20, verse 2, he's a member of the inner circle. And we see it in John 21, verse 7, he's a member of the inner circle. Now, the name John, son of ZBD, never appears in the gospel like that. John, the son of ZBD, which seems highly unusual because he was a member of the apostolic inner circle. Now, you remember that the early first century church, John being the last of the disciples, if you recall that, he had other disciples under him. And the early church fathers right, are the ones who picked up on the remaining portion of the history because you remember that one of the things that the church in Ephesus, the Ephesian church insisted was that John write down everything. So we do have some external uh, evidence, external as opposed to the internal. And that would be, A, the gospel was known by, first of all, number one, Irenaeus, the church, early church father, Irenaeus. And we know that Irenaeus, if you don't know anything about Irenaeus, is that uh, he lived between 120 A.D. and 202, roughly somewhere in that time period. But you know who was his mentor? Irenaeus, who was associated with Polycarp. And Polycarp knew John the apostle. He knew him personally. He was John's disciple. Okay? 
and you can read the story behind that. And that would be in the historical Ecclesiastics, Ecclesiasticus, and that was written by Eusebius, and that's in there. And he says that John, the disciple of the Lord, who reclined on his breast and himself, issued the gospel at Ephesus in Asia. In Asia. So we know that this external evidence corroborates this. We also know, secondly, that Clement of Alexandria, uh, between the years 153 and 217, he wrote, John was urged by his friends and divinely moved by the Spirit, composed a spiritual gospel. And we know that, again, Eusebius' uh, writings in the historical Ecclesiasticus is, is, is quoted in there. Third, Justin Martin, Justin Martyr, between 110 and 165. And when he wrote in his dialogue with Trifo, um, he also says that it is John who is the author. And then also we have the church father, Tertullian, Tertullian, uh, somewhere in the period between 145 and 220, also says that John's authorship asserted by early, early witnesses. Um, Polycarp, um, clearly, who was a disciple of John when he was alive, he asserts that, uh, that, that he was a bishop, uh, 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 but, uh, and he was a bishop at Smyrna later on in Smyrna, and he asserts that it was John who wrote that particular gospel. And then the writings of Papias, he was recorded, and that's recorded in what they call the Anti-Marcian Prologue from Rome, and Eusebius, the historical writer, who was the bishop of, the, of Hierapolis in, in Phrygia, and reported to be a disciple of John, the, uh, the apostle also. So John had a of apostles or a number of disciples under him. He's the last to die, okay? And, it's, and I think what's unique is that almost unanimous, they all say that it is John in their various writings, extra biblical writings, in their own writings, in their own letters circling around, that it is John and they were his personal disciples that wrote, wrote, the, wrote this particular gospel. Now, reasons used, there are a number of reasons used to doubt traditional authorship. Um, there are these reasons that do exist, and these are the ones that I mentioned to you that um, get used by a lot of people today. And I've heard it a lot from the camp of those who say they don't believe in the Trinity and they attack the Gospel of John. Uh, number one, the Gospel's connection with the Gnostic themes. Um, that is discussed highly. Uh, as one of the reasons why it's doubtful. Number two, the obvious appendix, uh, appendix of John chapter 21, that it wasn't there originally, it's added on to it. Uh, number three, the chronological discrepancies with the synoptics. Uh, here again, I told you that it is a different perspective in, and it's not by design to be a chronological biographical. And then for John would not have referred to himself as the beloved disciples, which is what most has believed, which is what most, which is what most of them believe. And number five, John, John's Jesus was different, uses different uh, vocabulary and genders from the synoptics. Well, of course, I mean, we had Matthew, a Jew, Luke, who was, was great at, at, at writing Greek, and then we have Mark, who takes and organizes a Gentile and organizes the writings of Peter. Right? So there are going to be differences. And then point G, if we assume it was John the Apostle, then what can we assume about the man himself? Well, we know that he wrote from number one, he wrote from Ephesus. Irenaeus says he issued the gospel from Ephesus, from where that church was, the Ephesian church. And secondly, he wrote when he was an older man. Irenaeus says he lived until the reign of Trajan, somewhere between 98 and 117. Uh, we know that somewhere in the period about 95, he receives the vision of um, the vision of what we call the book of Revelation. Uh, so we know that John does leave the island of Patmos. He's eventually removed and he goes back to Ephesus eventually somewhere in the future time period. Now the dating of the book. If we assume John the Apostle, then given the details, the, the uncanny precision, precision of the details of the historical and geographical facts of Jerusalem and what was happening was day, then we're going to have to assume somewhere between, it's before A.D. 70, somewhere there, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman general, later Emperor Titus, right? Well, but in John 5, 2, it says this, 
Now in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called, uh, in Hebrew, Bethesda, which has five porticos. Uh, we see that the repeated use of the early title disciples to denote the apostolic group. In other words, the, the, the term disciple is not the way John uses it. He doesn't use it openly for all of the disciples. Like, you know, Matthew lets us know toward the end of the book of Matthew. But in the way he uses it is almost strictly referring to the apostolic group. Um, the supposed, um, the supposed later Gnostic elements have now been discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's now been verified in the 1948 discovery of the scrolls, which show that they were part of the theological jargon of the first century because it was, it was part of that jargon. You know, if you, all you had to do is just go go read Galatians, Colossians, and you'll see it very clearly there. Okay? Also, there is no mention of the destruction of the temple in the city of Jerusalem that took place in A.D. 70. So, and when you read the details of this, uh, the way it's laid out in the book of John, <coughs> there is absolutely no mention of the destruction of the temple whatsoever. So it had to be somewhere between, before A.D. 70. And then the famous um, archaeologist, W.F. Albright, in his writings, um, he asserts a date for the gospel in the late 70s or early 80s. <coughs> and his assertion, part of it has to do with um, that John is writing in retrospect. Okay? But if he's writing in retrospect, why does he never ever mention the destruction of, um, of Jerusalem in the temple? He just doesn't seem to mention it. He doesn't even hint at it. It's not, even, it's not even insinuated in any form, in any shape or form. Yeah. Although W.F. Uh, uh, Albright's uh, work is an excellent work in archaeology, I have a, a very extensive, extensive collection. Um, uh, I know some people tell me I need a life, right? <laughs> and that is I have a very extensive, extensive collection of archaeological review uh, issues uh, that I've gone back and I've got them for several years. I don't know how many years I have them and I have literally gone through every single issue page by page from front from cover to cover. It is uh, fascinates me because um, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not a scientist. Um, most of it by and large is, is boring to me. However, the reason it's not boring is because it's always relating to the Word of God and ultimately the, the assertion or the supposition by which it starts out to disprove that God and anything to do with God, ultimately by the time you get to the end of the article, it's affirming this is true, this is true, this is true. And so, so W.F. Albright is not somebody I would discount throughout the window or the baby with the bathwater on, right? Later in the first century, um, A, there was, there, there was a developed theology of John. We know that. B, the fall of Jerusalem, not mentioned because it occurred some 20 years earlier. It's just not mentioned there. Uh, C, John's use of Gnostic-type phrasing and emphasis, which was wide uh, during that time period. And the early traditions of the church, both Arrhenius and Eusebius, was, um, really pushed toward the internal evidence of uh, that it is, it is John the Apostle who's, who's the author. And if we assume John the Elder, then the date would be early to mid-2nd century. Uh, this theory started with, it was started by Dionysius uh, uh, of rejecting of John the Apostle's authorship, and he does so for literary reasons. That, that, that's what he does it for, okay? Eusebius who rejected John the Apostle's authorship of Revelation for theological reasons, which is why he does it, felt that he had found another John. Um, who that John is, we don't know, but he felt that he had found another John at the right time and in the right place. And, and what he does, he takes part of Papias' writings and that's quoted. Remember I mentioned to you, um, Eusebius is the author of, of uh, uh, Historical Ecclesiasticus, um, and in there he lists two Johns, okay? One is the apostle, one is the elder, a presbyter, and but it never that. But even even the listing of that, even the discussion that has never, I, you know, I've, I've sat in lecture classes and it's never been clarified. When you ask the question, uh, it's amazing how many professors uh, do what I, I'm about to do. You, who knows? They just can't identify who he is. So, given that information about John, and you go, well, why was all that important? Well, it had to do with the fact that is that it, it does depend on what you believe and what you don't believe affects the authorship, affects the content as well. 
So who were the recipients originally of this particular gospel? Well, originally it was written to the churches of the Roman province of Asia, Asia Minor, and particularly to the church at Ephesus, the Ephesian church. Also because of the profound simplicity and the depth, the profound depth of this account of the life and the person of Jesus of Nazareth, this became a favorite gospel for both the Hellenistic Gentile believers and the Gnostic groups. Okay? So those are the two main groups who got a hold of this particular gospel the most and circulated it. Well, let's look at the purposes of this particular gospel, and that would be um, the gospel itself. It asserts that it has an evangelistic purpose. If you recall that when we were studying the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, I said that it was the most, it was, it was the book that did the majority of the categorization. Uh, it was, it, most people were categorized by, by, and trained by the book of Matthew. In fact, Matthew became an evangelistic track uh, because it just so much consumed, so did Mark. Um, but John, John Kelly makes the statement in John chapter 20, if we could see that here in, um, let's see, verse 30 and 31. This section discusses the purpose of John's gospel. It says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, the, and that believing you may have life in his name. So he gives us the purpose here very, very clearly. That it asserts that it's basically an evangelistic purpose. That's his design for him. And it's designed for three groups. Number one, the Jewish readers. Number two, the Gentile readers, re readers, the Gentile readers, and number three, the incipient Gnostic readers. So those are the three main groups that this gets uh, flushed out to. And it seems to have also some kind of an apologetical apolo uh, um, uh, thrust. Um, there is this... Um, thrust of apology, there's a thrust of defense, if you will, that's how that word is mostly used here, um, and it's used against a number of things. Number one, against the fanatic followers of John the Baptist. Uh, if you remember that there was a group there that became quite fanatical. Um, two, uh, against the incipient Gnostic false teachers, especially in the, remember the prologue that I mentioned to you, the, the, the anti-Martian prologue, um, these groups can be seen in all the New Testament books. We can see this uh, particularly in the book of Ephesians, Paul had to deal with them. In the book of Colossians, Paul had to deal with them. In, clearly in all the pastoral epistles, we see that, um, we can see it in 1 Timothy, we can see it in Titus, we can see it in 2 Timothy. Um, we also see it in 1 John, okay? Um, in fact, it's believed, some believe that the first John uh, may have functioned as a cover letter for the Gospel of John. And then also there is a possibility that the purpose statement that's found in John chapter 20, verse 31, which I read to you earlier, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. It's believed that may be understood as encouraging what? the doctrine of perseverance as well as evangelism because of the consistent use of the present, present, present tense to describe salvation. So in this sense, uh, John, like James, may be balancing an overemphasis of Paul's theology by some groups in Asia Minor. Um, we know that uh, because we can see that unpack, really unfold in 2 Peter, in the second book of Peter in chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. We can see that very clearly there. It is surprising that early church tradition identifies John with Ephesus and not Paul. That really is. I think um, um, F. F. Bruce in his writings, um, uh, if you recall, well, he, uh, in the book that he wrote, Peter, Stephen, James, and John studies in the non-Pauline studies in the non-Pauline Christianity. Um, he he he. He clearly refers and draws that a distinction for us and, and raises that issue for us. Uh, in the last chapter of John 21, or, or the epilogue, if you will, um, 
seems to have very specific, uh, it seems to answer very specific questions of the early church. Uh, John 21 does. Um, for, uh, here John supplements the accounts of the synoptic gospels. He does it in John chapter 21. Um, however, he focuses on what we would call the Judean ministry, particularly that in Jerusalem. That's where his main focus is on. You know, Luke, Luke was taking us all the way. You know, Luke for three main sections, the book of Luke, takes us all the way down. Okay, you remember that? It takes us all the way down to Jerusalem. It takes three main sections. That's the main body of Luke into Jerusalem, whereas John deals with Jerusalem, where Jesus is already. So we see that in there. Uh, the two questions that are uh, covered in the appendix, which is what would be chapter 21, um, and that is Peter's restoration. That issue is dealt with there. Um, uh, and John's longevity, we see that, and John's delayed return. Those issues get addressed in that last, very last section of the book of John. And some see John as a book that is de-emphasizing, if you will, all of the sacramental uh, uh, purposes, all of the uh, ignoring uh, what it's doing. It's ignoring, not recording or discussing the ordinances themselves. Um, we, we know that is not doing that uh, except for John chapter 3 when, he talk, when Jesus talks about baptism um, and John chapter 6 when he talks about the Lord's Supper. But other than that, John really doesn't get into the ordinances. Um, and we know that in both cases, it's used for the purposes of teaching by Jesus for the purpose of evangelism. So you see the difference, you, the different way of how those are used. Okay? Um, also, we see, uh, now we, let's look into an outline of John and begin to kind of just break this book down like we did for Matthew, like we did for Mark, like we did for Luke, quite different. We're going to have a different approach to this. Um, as I told you, John, John has seven major miracles and signs by which the entire book of John is structured around. Also, John has 27 distinct dialogues or conversations or interviews with people of which highlight theological issues. So that's very distinct about it. And then third, we have the presentation of the I am God, the I am's uh, that gets repeated over and again, over and over again. We see that. Here. So let's look at that very briefly here um, in the outline. First of all, we have from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, we have a, philosoph a philosophical theological prologue. It's what it is. If, if I can put those three words together, that's how I would do it. A philosophical, philosophical theological prologue, that's really the first eight verses of John chapter 1. And remember, John, Matthew and Luke starts with the birth of Christ. Mark starts with the baptism of Christ, but John starts before the creation. So you see the distinct flavor of each book. Okay? Very, very different. And so when we see that, if you understand that about John, what I just said, the latter statement, which is that it starts before the creation story. That's when John starts. Okay? Then you understand that there is a distinct philosophical, theological prologue right at the outset of the book of John in, John in the first eight verses. We can see that very clearly here. And it has a practical, and then, but it has a very practical ending. You know, you have this very deep, profound, philosophical, theological prologue in the very the beginning, you know. And then at the end here, it's, it can be, it's, it's the most practical book of all. It's just absolutely amazing. It's almost schizophrenic, if you will. Okay? Um, then we have the seven miracle signs that I talked about. The seven miracle signs during Jesus' public ministry. And those are very laid out for us in very, very detail. Chapter 2 all the way to chapter 12. Those signs are there, uh, very laid out, and, and, and including all of the interpretation. Uh, we don't, you know, I, I've said this before, even where, where I pass at a church, is that I've told, I've told this before. There's only one interpretation. Only one interpretation to every single verse in the Bible. There's only one clear interpretation, okay, to every single parable, miracle, everything that's ever laid out. Okay? Where you cannot do, when you cannot make that statement openly, okay, is when you deal with the prophecies because prophecies are still being unfolded, okay, except for the ones that have already come to pass. Now, but what you do have is multiple applications. So when we get to John, it is in inconceivable, at least in my
me a little ahead here, okay? And is that we would not understand the interpretations of these particular signs and miracles that took place because the interpretation for every single, all seven of them, is given with great clarity. And so John, out of all the Gospels, okay, not only is it distinct, but John brings more clarity than any other of the, any of the other three Gospels. So we cannot fail to understand and get the proper understanding of the interpretation of the seven miracles and the seven signs.